going to the small Old Testament book of Ruth. So if you're in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and then Ruth. It's just uh, four short chapters. And we're probably going to use this today. Uh, we're going to start off not a verse-by-verse verse series, but just a little mini-series through the book of Ruth, just kind of applying some things uh, in the book of Ruth. And as we turn to the book of Ruth, it's uh, one of the only two books in the Bible that are uh, named after a woman, the other being Esther, and both really having kind of similar themes. And well, what we're going to see here in the book of Ruth is that uh, in the setting of this book, this time period, it was really a dark time, a dark time uh, beginning uh, personally uh, for, for Ruth and, and those that surrounded her, but also in, in the nation of Israel, in the time of the land at this time. And what we're going to see, though, through this book is that even in uh, the dark times, uh, that the light of God still shines. Uh, that the light of the Lord still shines, that he is still at work, and he does some of his most amazing work in the dark times. And there's just some great things that happen here uh, in the book of uh, Ruth that God uses just uh, hit, to change to history uh, in this dark time. And I think that this is a, a good and applicable book, ac applicable book for this time. So we're going to start today. We're just going to read all of uh, chapter one to begin with. Like I said, we're not doing verse by verse, but I want to draw some applications from some things here in this first chapter. So let's start in verse one. It says, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there were, was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab he and his wife and his two sons, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Kilon, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Kilon died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people." And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. And if I should say, I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes." that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Wherefore thou diest, where, where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt bitterly with me. 
I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. And so as we uh, uh, re begin to read this book, we're going to find, I said that it was uh, obviously we can see personally a dark time in uh, the life of Naomi who had uh, lost her husband, who had lost her two sons, and uh, they had to flee. They ended up fleeing out of uh, Bethlehem where they stayed because of famine. And so we can see that it was a, a dark time there just personally in their lives. But overall, in the overall context, we can see that this was a dark time because in the first verse we get the setting of this book of Ruth. In the first verse it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. You know, I, I don't know when I first started really reading the Bible and kind of going through some of these books, it didn't dawn on me that this story of Ruth, and it, it says it right there, plain as can be, the setting of this story is actually the book previous. You know, the context of the story of Ruth that we're reading now is in the previous book of the Judges. Uh, that is the time, that is the setting that this book uh, takes place. And if you know the story of Ruth, it, it, it's really kind of amazing to see uh, what God is doing with, these, with the lives of Ruth and the people in this story in the midst of a dark time in the nation of Israel. Because if you know the book of Judges, the book of Judges is another uh, kind of dark time in the history of Israel. Uh, you see a continuing theme and pattern in the book of Judges. That in the book of Judges, you know, the nation is unified and, uh, uh, you know, serving God, and then they, they decide to go after false gods. They turn away from the commandments of God, and they end up being judged. They end up being delivered into the hands of the enemies, into other nations, and being ruled over by other nations until they get to the point where they humble themselves, repent, and cry out to God. And then God, in the book of Judges, that's why it's called Judges, he, he raises up a judge. He gives somebody that's specially gifted to uh, help deliver them out of the hands of their enemies. But then it's not too long when they, they go back and they do the same thing again. They turn away from God, they serve false idols, God delivers them into the hands of their enemies, uh, then they repent, they cry out to God, he, he, he sends another judge. And it's kind of like this cycle over and over and over again. And there's no leadership. And really the whole book of Judges can be summed up really in this last verse that we see in the book of Judges. It should be on the same page that we have here in Ruth 1. But if you look in uh, Judges 22-25, the very last verse of the book of Judges, it says, In those days... There was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that's, that's really the root of the problem in, of, in the children of Israel in the book of Judges is that there was no leadership. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And we see what I, in my opinion, I believe one of the darkest stories in all of the Bible uh, you can find in Judges uh, chapter 19. And I believe it's a direct result of no leadership, every man doing what is right in his own eyes. And so we see that that is the setting of, uh, that's the time period we're in here uh, with the story of Ruth. is in the times of the judges, a dark time. But like I said before, you know, that's what makes this story so amazing. Is that the light of God doesn't stop in the dark times in our world. You know, uh, God doesn't stop working uh, when things go bad in our world, when people are disobedient in the, in the, in the world. And uh, that's the hope that we have here through this story. It's a story of, of great faith in the midst of a dark time. And as we continue here, we see uh, in verse 1, it says that it was in the times of the judges that there was a famine in the land. And so, again, at the, in this specific story here, there was a famine in the land. A famine is when there is a, a no food. The food is run out. May there be because there's a drought. Maybe there's no water uh, to uh, feed the crops. Uh, you know, hard economic time, but it's a time of famine. And, you know, we still, 
Even today in our modern times, there's still places in the world uh, where there's famines, where there is a lack of food. There's, uh, you can look them up at statistics. It would probably stagger you how many people still die of starvation. Uh, and I don't know if they're true, but there's a lot of statistics about people here in America that, that die of starvation every day. Kids that die of starvation in America. No, we don't, like, we don't think uh, in our modern times that there's still famine, but there's still famine uh, that goes on in our world. But, you know, there's not just famine uh, can be different things other than just a lack of food. You know, there can be other types of famines uh, that come into our life. You know, there can be uh, a spiritual famines. You know, times where you get uh, spiritually uh, down, spiritually destitute, and there can come a spiritual famine in your life. Uh, the Bible in Amos, the prophecy of Amos describes uh, a different kind of famine. In Amos chapter 8, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You see, in that day, Amos, the prophet preaching unto Israel, pronounced a famine not of bread, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. You know, that's a different kind of famine. And uh, we can see that that famine is prevalent in our country today. You know, there might be uh, churches all over street corners, but are any of them preaching the word of God anymore? You know, there's some places... Uh, that you can't find a good church. I know I've heard testimony from some people here that they search for a long time to find a church in their area that preached the word of God and could not find one. It's a famine of hearing the, the word of the Lord. You know, and that causes me to pause and thank God uh, that he has blessed us with the church. And I thank God for that he's blessed us to have a church of people who care about the word of God, who, who want and desire to hear the words of God. Uh, who, who talk about the word of God amongst themselves and try to, the best they can, to apply it to their lives. You know, I hope we don't take that for granted. You know, because the moment you begin to take the word of the Lord for granted, you might fall on a, a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. You know, famines can come in many different ways, and we can see they don't just happen uh, to the bad people. You know, there's a lot of uh, good people in Scripture uh, that went through a famine. You know, uh, Joseph, a good and godly man, he went through a famine. Uh, David, King David, uh, there was a time in his life where he went through a famine. You know, the question is not, uh, is there ever going to be a famine that's going to happen? Look, the famines are going to come. Look, whether they're physical, whether they're spiritual, uh, we're going to fall. The famines are going to come. There's going to be famines in your life. And many would probably describe the time that we're going through right now in our world as a time of, of famine. But the question is, uh, what will you do in the famine? How are you personally going to respond to the famine? How are you going to handle the family? Now we have uh, here a man named Elimelech. Elimelech who said uh, he was a part of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Judah, lived in Bethlehem, Judah. And his response to the famine was to flee, was to run. He took his family and he left Bethlehem, Judah, and went to the heathen nation of Moab. Now it's pretty ironic uh, when you think about what the name Bethlehem means. The, the word Bethlehem it means the house of bread. So Elimelech left the house of bread to go to Moab during the famine. And that is something, if you know the scripture, that he should have never done. You know, as being a part of the nation of Israel, they had commandment from God. They know that the Moabites, they were their mortal enemies. Uh, remember, if we went through the book of Numbers, we talked about that prophet, uh, that prophet for hire, Balaam. Right? The Moabites, the Ammonites, they were a, a heathenist people that were enemies of Israel that hired Balaam to curse Israel. Uh, they wanted to destroy Israel. They were the enemy. Elimelech should have never fled to Moab. Yet when the famine came, you know, he was probably worried about how he could take care of his family. Uh, he abandoned what he knew what was right and he fled for Moab. 
to a heathen country. That's what Elimelech did. And we see that just like uh, anybody, any other decisions, especially if you're in a place of leadership, like Elimelech was, being the head of his house, when you make a decision, it's not just you that you're dragging into that decision. He took both of his sons, uh, Malan and Kylan, and his wife, Naomi, along with him. You know, we read the scripture last week in James. It says, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. You know, what that verse is saying is that there, you know, don't let there be too many. There's not many leaders. There's not many people that are taking the mantle and leader knowing that they're going to receive the greater condemnation. Right? Because leadership comes with a great responsibility. Because you have people that are following you. And so the greater condemnation is going to be on those who lead if they lead people astray. And that's what we see here with Elimelech. That he led his wife and family and he, he, he brought on his own death. You know, in fleeing to Moab, it, it caused the, him his life and the life of his two sons. And you know what, well, you might not consider yourself a leader. I, I think we all are a leader in some aspect or another. Right? You might not be the pastor of the church where I'm going to have greater condemnation should I come up here and preach something that's not out of the word of God. That's a very serious thing when you open your mouth to preach the word of God uh, because you better be preaching in spirit and in truth. Right? But don't think that you guys are off the hook either because every single person here, in some way or another, you're leading somebody. Uh, if you have some children, you're, you're leading those children. Uh, you have somebody, I'm sure, in your life that is looking to you for leadership in some way. And so the decisions we make are important because they don't often just involve us. You know, there's people who are looking to us. There's people who are watching us. There's people who are following us. And Elimelech made the wrong decision. And it cost him his life and the life of his two sons. And you know, sometimes in the rough times, in the times of famine, uh, you know, where we don't see a way out, uh, we can excuse things and think, oh, well, I'll just, maybe I'll abandon the commandments of God. I'll know, I'll abandon what I know is right uh, just for a time. It's just for now, just this special circumstance. And I, I think we probably see that in Elimelech too. Because it says here in verse 1 that when they left Bethlehem, Judah, they went to sojourn in the country of Moab. You know, it was, I don't believe his intention in setting out that they were going to stay in Moab. They were just going to sojourn there. It was just going to be for a short time. You know, we're just going to go in for a little time, get what we need, you know, uh, take care of my family, and then we're going to get out of there. But we see at the end of verse 2, that's not what happened. It says, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. You see, they didn't just sojourn, they ended up staying there. And so even for 10 years, it said. And so what maybe started out as just them sojourning, they ended up continuing there. And again, that uh, we need to be careful with the decisions we make, whether in bad times, good times, uh, in the famine. Don't allow the famine and the things that are surrounding us to cloud what we know to be right and to cloud our judgment. Because even though we might uh, deceive ourselves... And fool ourselves into thinking, well, I'm just going to do this for a short time. I know this isn't the right move or this is not what God told me to do, but I'm just going to sojourn there. You know, you're playing with fire because you might find yourself continuing there and destroying yourself there. And that's what happened to Elimelech is that he, he stayed there, he continued there, and it was for his life and, as I said, the life of his two sons. You know, it shows a lack of trust, a lack of faith in God uh, that he, he, he decided to just flee in the time of famine and flee in the hard times. And, you know, famines can be a time of great testing of our faith. You know, are we really trusting in God or are we trusting in ourselves? You know, there's a lot of people that talk a big game when everything's going all right. You know, when we're at peace and we're at good, they're, oh, yeah, I'm never going to, I'm never going to quit. I'm never going to fail. I'm always going to follow the Lord. I'm always going to do this. I'm always going to do it. As we're, 
you know, living high on the hog. You know, as we're able to come to church unmolested, as we go home and we can fill our faces with all, any kind of food we want, as we can just sit back and be an armchair quarterback and never actually have to get, have our feet put to the fire. But then when the famine comes, is, are, are we gonna, is our faith going to stay that strong? And don't for a second think that any of us are, uh, where the, the strength lies within ourselves. Uh, you know, many men have faltered in thinking that. You know, I thought the, the we just talking about this yesterday with Brother Rude, that uh, the Apostle Peter, if you remember, before uh, Jesus was put on trial to be crucified, and he's telling him that he was going to have to suffer and that he was going to die. Uh, Peter, he, he boldly, man, he stood up, I'll never die, deny you, I'll die right with you. And we see just not... Shortly after that, Peter denying Jesus three times. And I, I, don't, I, I doubt that any of us faith is at the level where Peter's was at that point. You know, and so let's, let's be realistic in looking at our own selves. And remember that the strength is not in our resolve. The strength is not in our will. Uh, the, the strength is not in us at all. We become strong when we actually become weak. Because then Christ is strong in us. Uh, we need to realize that our strength comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it says, but I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The moment you begin to think that I can do all things through anything else other than Jesus Christ, uh, you're going to run in the famine. And some, some of our already have. You know, there's many people who through this famine, if we want to call it that, have fled, have run from church, and will never come back. You know, I, we come from Bible Baptist Church. Uh, it was a great church about, I think we were running 400 or more people there. And there's still a large segment, maybe 50 or more people. I, I might, it may be less than that, but that we're solid, faithful church members they, they could quote you scripture, uh, you know, they would be the type, hey, we're never going to fall, we've never come back to church. The church has been open for a long time, months now, and they still haven't come back, and they probably never will come back. You know, the famine can really test where your faith's at, and who you really trust in. And again, we need to realize that our strength lies in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, go with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 33. Psalm 33, let's start reading in verse 13. It says, The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. Look, the, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere all the time. He's looking down from heaven at the sons of men. He's looking down at us. In verse 14, it says, From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Verse 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in the famine. You see, God's looking down. He's looking down and the ones he's going to honor, the ones here he's going to bless, the ones he's going to carry through the famine are those that fear him, are those that are looking to him uh, for their stay, looking to him for their security, looking to him for their blessings. Not the ones who are working the hardest, not the ones who think they're the wisest and coming up with the best battle plans and the best game plans, not the ones that have the biggest armies, not the ones that have the strongest horses, not the ones that have the most wealth, uh, he's looking for those that fear him. 
He's looking for those that will humble themselves and trust the Lord, and he will bring them through the famine. You see, Elimelech decided to go in his own power, and he didn't get through the famine. Right? The, our hope is in the Lord. But you know, this story isn't all dark. There's great hope in this story here, too. Because God doesn't stop working in the famine. Even if there are people who don't fear him, don't trust him, won't follow his ways. God's still doing amazing things, and he does amazing things here in this story of Ruth. And we're going to see that through the faith of Ruth. You see, Elimelech, he leaves uh, his wife, Naomi, his two sons that died. They married women of Moab, uh, Ruth and a lady named Orpah, and left them widows. And so now you have these ladies that got caught in the wake of this bad decision that Elimelech uh, left, and they're left widowed. And by themselves, but they're not by themselves because the, the Lord is with them. The Lord is going to take care of them. But we see here in verse 6 of Ruth, it says, Then she arose, this is talking about Naomi, with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. You see what, there, what happened there? You know, Elimelech never had to leave Judah in the first place. She was off in Moab and hears about how the Lord visited his people and how there's now bread in Bethlehem, Judah, and now they're going back. And you, you wonder to yourself, what might have happened with this man Elimelech if had he just stayed put? Had he just had trust in the Lord and waited upon the Lord, uh, the Lord provided bread. But now Naomi hears that the Lord had visited his people and they're going to turn back. And I want you to know that that, that again should remind us uh, that the Lord is always the way out of the famine. We see that the Lord starts this off. The Lord had visited his people. Uh, the Lord uh, begins to bring the hope, uh, begins to bring the light at the end of the tunnel through this famine. It all started with the Lord visiting his people. Now, uh, these two daughter-in-laws, again, like I said, they were of the country of Moab. You know, they didn't come from Bethlehem, Judah. Uh, they were found there when they went and sojourned and actually continued there in Moab. And so these two daughter-in-laws, as you, we saw from reading chapter 1, they first, both of them, purposed that, hey, we're going to follow you, uh, Naomi. We're going to stay here with you, and we're going we're gonna to go where you go. Both of them decided that together. But Naomi, again, she said, look, there's no, don't, why, I don't want you to do that. She said, look, if, even if I were to have hope today that I were to have a husband and that uh, we were to have children, are you going to wait? Are you going to stay around until those children uh, grow up uh, so that they, I can give them to you as their husbands? You're not going to do that. She's saying, just, just stay here. Go back to your family. Uh, you know, go find you husbands and, and have a life here. I don't, don't be destroyed along with me. Uh, don't continue in my misery is, what, you know, basically what she's saying. And we see how one of those uh, ladies, Orpah, uh, she just, she decided she didn't, her heart probably wasn't all the way in it. You know, uh, she decided to go back to her family, go back to, as it said here, her gods and she kissed Naomi and decided to leave. But Ruth, on the other hand, was different. Ruth decided that she was going to stay. That she was going to stay with Naomi no matter what. That she was going to cleave to her. And she said she would be judged by God if anything but death would depart her from Naomi. You know, when we look at that, we think of the, what great loyalty uh, that Naomi had to her, or I'm sorry, not Naomi, but Ruth had to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and that no matter what, she would stay with her. And sometimes we think that it's just maybe her loyalty uh, to Naomi uh, that kept her there and that she was just a good woman. But we see that it was, it was far more than that. That it wasn't just her loyalty to Naomi, but she had faith in the true and living God. She had faith in Jehovah, the true and living God. And that, I believe, was the major reason why Ruth stayed, because of Ruth's faith. And if we look in the scripture here, uh, go with me in, in verse uh, 
uh, 14. In verse 14 of chapter 1, and it says, And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone unto her people and unto her gods. You see that small g, gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So see, her sister-in-law, she went back to her people and she went back to her false gods. In verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. She was going to make the God of Naomi, the true God, her God. And you know, I don't know, we don't have any background. Maybe she had learned about the true God from Naomi. Uh, maybe Naomi had taught her, been a witness to her. And she decided that she was not just going to follow Naomi. She was going to make Naomi's God her God. And we see that in what she says in verse 17. Look what she says. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught be but death, depart thee and me. Now you see there in Lord, the Lord... When she says, the Lord do so more to me, that's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Uh, that means she's talking about Jehovah. She's talking about the true and living God. She's just not talking about just another God. She's talking about Jehovah, God of the Bible. And she's even saying, look, the Lord will do to me more. And also, if anything but death, depart us. Look, she had decided to make Naomi's God her God. She had come to trust in the true and living God. We also know that if we were to skip ahead, I don't want to go too much, but uh, in the story, uh, if we go to chapter 2, verse 12, we're going to talk more about this godly man Boaz next week, but look what this godly man Boaz says about Naomi when they go back uh, to Bethlehem in verse 12 of chapter 2. It says, the Lord recompense thy work, and he is talking about Ruth, and a full reward given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. You see, Naomi, it was more than just, or I'm sorry, Ruth, I keep saying Naomi. Uh, Ruth, it was more than just her being loyal to her mother-in-law. It was more than just her uh, wanting to care for her mother-in-law. Uh, she had faith in God. She has come to trust in the true and living God. And it was her faith that propelled her to make that decision as her sister-in-law turned back to her false gods. And I want to think about the faith that this decision would take. You know, here Ruth, uh, she's not promised anything. Look, she has no, she's a widow and a, a young lady, that's uh, the rest of her life, uh, as we would think, ahead of her. A and she has no promise of a husband. Uh, she's going to leave everything that she knows. She's not from Bethlehem. She knows nothing about Bethlehem. She's from uh, Moab, the enemies of where she's going. She is going to enemy territory of her people. She's going to leave her family, her friends, uh, the people that she knows, uh, the, the false gods that she has been taught uh, to worship when she grows up. For, for what? For no promise of anything. She doesn't know that she's going to have anything awaiting for her uh, there in Bethlehem. She just knows that she's trusting in God and she's going to stay with Naomi no matter what. And you know, I, that's, sometimes, that's, what we got, that's what God respects is just our faith, our faith and devotion. You know, sometimes we think that we have to have everything mapped out, that we can't make a decision or step out for the Lord unless we know exactly how it's all going to work out and how it's all going to plan out. I'm telling you, that's just not going to happen. You know, uh, faith pleases God. It, it takes no faith when you know, when you've got everything all planned out and figured out and you think you know exactly every move you're going to make and when you're going to make it. You know, so many people try to devise these roadmaps for life. You know, they try to have everything uh, just built in, like I'm going to work for this long, I'm going to retire at this age, I'm going to have X number of kids, and I'm going to make this amount of money and they just think they're risk proofing their entire life. Right? They've got it all figured out. It, faith doesn't work that way. 
There's a lot of people who uh, they won't believe in Jesus Christ because they've got to know everything first. Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to read the Bible first, and then I'm going to come to church. I want to learn everything there is to learn first from the Bible, and I want to make an educated decision. And look, uh, uh, praise God, I, you know, I still believe there's some people who can be delivered out of that, but, you know, that's not faith. Look, you're not going to know everything. We talked about last week how uh, these things are spiritual things. And the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Look, if you think if there's a, a lost person, maybe if you're lost here today and you think that you can figure everything out first and just play church for a while and then make a well-educated decision and then come to faith after you've got, you know everything there is to know about the Bible, it's not going to work like that. You know, and we as God's children, uh, sometimes, at sometimes we got to realize that we can't always just have all of our ducks in a row and have everything perfect. Uh, that sometimes we just have to take that blind step of faith and trust that God is going to take care of us. And that's exactly what we see in Ruth here. She has no promise of a husband. She's leaving everything she knows. Uh, she has no promise of a life there in Bethlehem, Judah. Uh, she's just taking this step on faith. And you know that, I think God pulls that out in the famine. You know, he, it's a great time of testing. You know, where is our faith? What are we really trusting? Remember what we read, it's a vain thing to trust in, in horses and chariots and a great army in battle. Look, but you never fail trusting in the Lord. Look, I, I can look on times where I think I've even made a bad decision, but doing it in faith, uh, God worked it all together for my good. Because you can't make a wrong decision in faith. Look, we might, from an earthly standpoint, might think, oh, that guy made a bad decision. But look, if you're sincerely trying to follow the Lord and put your faith and trust in him, he will not fail you. And that's what we see in Ruth here, and that's what we see in this story. And we see that God uses Ruth. He's kind of the catalyst to give her and Naomi uh, both hope in this great and dark time in their life in this great and dark time uh, in history, even when Naomi, who should have been the more mature, more seasoned, godly person, couldn't see it. You know, because if you read through here in chapter 1, you know, Ruth is saying, I'm going to stay with you no matter what. I'm going to trust in your God. We see the childlike faith of Ruth, but we see the bitterness of Naomi. That Naomi is caught up in her trials and caught up in all of her circumstances, and she become bitter about it and hopeless you know she uh went back to bethlehem and they say oh is this naomi and she's she's so bitter she's saying don't call me naomi anymore right the uh, name naomi means pleasant one she's saying don't i'm not don't call me naomi call me mara mara means bitter she's saying just i don't call me by that Call me Mara. She's telling them, just make my name bitter because I'm bitter. And she, she wasn't holding back any on it. She was just making it plain. She was bitter. But you see, even amongst her bitterness and, you know, just being down by this season of famine in her life, uh, God's still at work and he's using Naomi. We see at the beginning of the book of Ruth in, chapter, in verse 1, we talk, we've been talking about the whole time that it started with famine. That there was a famine in the land. But look how chapter 1 ends. It says in verse 22, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. They left out in a famine, no food, but when they return, we see it's the beginning of barley harvest. There's food now. You know, and it's the beginning, a new beginning. And we see that's what, and it's Ruth's faith in the Lord. Actually, the Lord started it all off. But we see that the hope is going to come through the Lord and through the faith of Ruth as we read this story that God's going to bring them through the famine. The famine's going to end. The harvest has now started and now they're going to they're begin to reap. And you know what? When we have faith in God through the famine, look, the harvest can start again. He can give us, he's the God of new beginnings. Amen for that. 
You know, the famine's not going to last with God. He'll get us through and, and bring us to the harvest. And so that's what we're going to see here through as we study through the book of Ruth. But the question today is, what are you doing in the famine? You know, and famines are coming. Maybe, you're, maybe you don't consider this a famine in your life, but you're going to hit a time in your life where the famine's going to come. Uh, how, what are you doing? Uh, do you have faith in God? Are you trusting in the commandments of God? Are you staying true to God? Or are you running away like a limelight? I hope we've learned that that's not a wise decision. Uh, Riley, if you come ahead, look to the Lord in prayer.